Are you curious about how the concepts and equations of physics have transformed over time, taking us from the classical world to the realm of modern physics? How did Maxwell's equations of electricity and magnetism give birth to the field of electromagnetism and setting the stage for modern physics? What groundbreaking insights did Planck's quantum theory bring to the table, challenging classical notions and heralding a new era in physics? How did Einstein's theory of special relativity shatter our understanding of time and space, completely reshaping the classical worldview? From Isaac Newton's classical mechanics to Einstein's groundbreaking theories of relativity, we are going to explore today the pivotal moments that revolutionized physics. Get ready to witness this extraordinary journey of ideas that have redefined our perception of reality. Do not miss this enthralling exploration into the world of physics, present, past and beyond. My name is Shonak and you are watching this video on my channel Physics for Students. Welcome to this fresh new video from classical to modern physics, how the concepts and equations of physics have evolved over time. Well, before we go ahead with this video, I will like to tell what is the objective of this video because this video is meant for a definite objective which I want to make very clear. The first thing is that we are going to understand the scientific revolution that resulted in our current understanding of the universe. Then we are going to understand that why from classical physics we move to modern physics, basically the need or the limitations that gave rise to that. Obviously we are going to look into the third point which is the limitation of classical physics and the need for a new scientific era, a new scientific understanding. And lastly which is the most important is that we are going to see why the generalizations of equations happen and how it brought a broader perspective in understanding how the equations and our understanding of physics and mathematics changes. Having set this objective, we would start our journey and our journey begins in ancient times where from the observations of nature were localized and limited. From the enigmatic pyramids to early astronomical discoveries, ancient civilization laid the foundation of our human curiosity. As you see that human beings, once they started to mature, uh, they developed starting worshipping the forces of nature and then develop hunting instruments. I am talking of those ages when human beings were staying in the caves and they were not yet civilized enough to get into the current society and that is what is called the evolution of scientific theories, evolution of human mind. So as you can see these illustrations actually show the evolution of human beings in terms of maturing their mind and developing the hunting instruments for their own survival. We move on to the next that when we see that the evolution of automobiles from 1886 to the current era, how these models have changed. We also see that there is a significant rise in the evolution of living style, how the houses changes and even the lifestyle of human beings, how the evolution of dress happened. Even we see that there is a certain change in the evolution of the eating style, that is when we used to live in the caves, when we used to burn or eat raw food and then slowly we start to culture and nurture agriculture and then we are sitting on a chair and a table on a fine dining restaurant and eating certain things and you we also see there is a significant rise in the evolution of entertainment that is from the televisions how it started and how it evolved well all these things taken into consideration actually shows the evolution and certain important things that is the evolution of lifestyle instruments scientific thoughts and most importantly a certain important thing. What is that thing coming up into the next part of our video? So you see that when a human brain evolves from mouse to macaw to chimpanzee and you see that the size of the human brain is significantly bigger. That means that evolution has takes place, taken place. You can see that the hedgehog and how man, there is a certain more complex neural networks which shows that the evolution here also takes place. A uh, human being right from this stage when they were uh, apes and then when they grew into a full-blown human being, how the size and the contour 
nature of the human brains have changed. As you can see on the right hand side of the illustration, there are a certain number of lines which were less in a chimpanzee or in the early human being which has become more complex with the evolution of time. We started taming the forces of nature as science advanced, so did our desire to unify the forces uh, happened. So the scientific evolution, when we started unifying the forces, our desire to unify forces generally started from then on. The fusion of electricity and magnetism by Maxwell, the quest for unified theory of Einstein and the standard models, unification of particles and interaction, all were striving for a grander and a more comprehensive understanding. As you can see in this one, we once we started taming the forces, what we find is that gravity, strong force, weak force, electromagnetism, these are the four forces which we understood and we always strive to unite these forces. Well, this video is is not about the unification of forces which I have already made. You can look up into my uh, channel Physics for Student. But what we are trying to tell is that if I take now a current car, then you see that it serves a lot of purpose. First, we can drive, we can sleep, we can listen to music, we can dine. I mean to say all those activities apart from driving the car from a destination to another destination serves the purpose. Even we take off a smart television, you see we can not only watch films, but we can use it as a computer screen, we can play YouTube videos and we can put our flash drives to play our specific movie or the specific song that we want. Also what we see is that when we talk of a modern uh, mobile, we can talk and not only that, we can watch films, we can use it as a compass, we can check the weather, we can make videos and we can do a lot. I think nowadays the smartphones can do a lot of things other than talking. So what is the basic essence that I am trying to tell? I am trying to tell this one. That means the purpose is generalization. The purpose is putting everything under one roof and get the maximum out of that device. This purpose of generalization, as we now see in the current understanding, which started with the Neolithic and Paleolithic age and which moved with uh, the passage of time, is something which revolutionized our understanding of physics and mathematics. And with this revolution and with this generalization of different functions into one specific instrument, we come to the most, uh, I would say the earliest and the most important understanding that is the understanding of space and time. In this part of the video, we will uh, now look into how the concept of space and time is now being generalized, what are the results, why it was done and what are the specific equations that got into it. Uh, with Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica coming up, what we see that space was space, time and time, and it was totally two different entities which were taking place. And what we see is that time alone uh, is independent, it is just clicking and the uh, world is getting old, and everything around physics, which was uh, written by in the Principia Mathematica, the monumental work, motion, momentum, torque, rotation, gravity, everything was taking place. So we can say this is the place where all the physics were taking place here. What we see is that in Newtonian physics, we consider time to be something independent entity and it is treated as a universal clock which is ticking and ticking and ticking at a constant rate and it is unaffected by the presence of matter and gravity. What we get from here is what we called uh, this axis which is called an XYZ axis through which we started to measure the length, breadth and time and the space was actually described in terms of the three-dimensional Euclidean geometry. Now, with the passage of time, what we see is that Albert Einstein's theory uh, revolutionized uh, entire understanding. Time and space was unified into one, and we get something which is called a space-time continuum, and all the physics takes place here. So, as you can see, time and space is now not independent unity but it took place in here and as for put forward by J. R. Newman that from henceforth space by itself uh, and time by itself have vanished into the merest shadows and only a kind of a blend of the two exists in its own right. So that is basically the merest shadows that means it has vanished from the Newtonian mechanics and it has taken place with the passage of time uh, it has been united and it has been united into one specific continuum which is called a space time continuum. Obviously the question rises that why Einstein unified and what was actually the need for unifying space and time. So this is the first question uh, apart from our basic understanding of evolution of scientific and technological thoughts that why Einstein generalized it coming into the next part of our video. Now you see that 
the basic tenets of special theory of relativity tells that the laws of physics has to be same regardless of whatever the motions or gravitational field that the person is operating. Now from this basic postulate what we can find is, the, is that space and time must be intervened. Obviously if the laws of physics are the same then how can space and time uh, considered to be different? That means if I take a person who is watching a kind of an event at a specific time interval the same person will see the same event at another frames of reference. So obviously if the frames of reference are the same then how can space and time be different? Also we find that the postulate of special theory of relativity tells that speed of light is constant. That means obviously if you are trying traveling at a speed of light I would not experience or you would not experience any passage of time. The next thing is that there are certain relativistic effects. I am not going into the mathematical complexities of this, which is time dilation, length contraction and various other things. These were not possible to explain until and unless Einstein would have united space-time into a space-time. And the geometrical description of gravity where it tells that matter in general relativity is responsible for the curvature, then how can time be different? Taken all these facts together, what we understand from this, space, uh, from this part of the video is that somehow the laws of physics, the postulates and the complexities and the equations which Einstein formulated, space and time cannot be different as perceived by Newton in the classical era which has to be entwined into something which is called a space-time continuum. Otherwise the equations, otherwise the postulates, otherwise the frames of reference unifying the laws of physics to be same would have not been possible. So the question now is that what are basically the intuitive ideas that uh, perceived into Einstein's mind? Let us look into that and summarize it. So everything got into something which is called is a space-time continuum. And this space-time continuum are first the constancy of speed of light, second would be the principle of relativity and third one is called simultaneity is relative. That is why we, the frames of reference has to be united into some kind of a concept otherwise this person would see an uh, event happening uh, in some other way and that person will see the event happening in some other way. So all these intuitions uh, took place in uh, Einstein's mind and what it came from here is that space and time cannot be different and space and time has to be united. So this is the first breakthrough, the first generalization of space and time into a space-time continuum which started with Newton and completed by Albert Einstein through his special theory of relativity. Now when we talk of uh, space and time, another thing that uh, keeps in our mind is that what are the other uh, mathematical and physics concepts which took the generalization. Coming up into the next part of our video, we will look into something which is called a Newtonian to Hamiltonian. Well, Isaac Newton's uh, Principia Mathematica and the laws of equations were quite good enough in order to explain the laws of motion, especially if I take this kind of a body which is uh, moving in a simple one dimension, then F equals to MA is quite sufficient enough to describe the laws of motion equations. The uh, revolution of Earth and other celestial bodies along the line, along a big gravitating body. But the thing is that what we understand from here that this only takes place place in Cartesian coordinates, flat coordinates, where the entire coordinate is being dictated by Euclid's geometry. But what happens when we take this kind of a thing, that is a curvilinear coordinates, what happens when a lot of, you know, closely knitted bodies starts interacting with each other? You see these bodies are starting interacting with one and another and another. Well, what happens is that the F equals to MA uh, really doesn't work out in this type of a curvilinear coordinate or interaction of bodies intricately rel related with each other. So we have to go back from England to another uh, country which is France and we have to understand what Joseph Louis Lagrange actually took and what is called a Lagrangian. Well in this video we'll, we will not look in too much into what is called a Lagrangian but without this understanding of basic generalization from Newtonian to the other radius things would be incomplete. So here is a quick idea what is a Lagrangian. 
So the Lagrangian is basically a generalization of the Newton's laws of motions and things which were quite difficult and which was not possible to be described in Newton's laws of motion were described by Lagrangian. So if I take the basic equation, it is this one. This is the Lagrangian. This is the kinetic energy and this is the potential energy. So it describes in a much more general way which uh, there were limitations in order to describe the Newton's laws of motion. If I take it mathematically and expand it, this is the uh, equation. But don't worry, we are not going to delve deep into this equation. I'm just showing this equation to let you know, one, that Lagrangian is a function and number two, it is a function of the system position coordinates. So this is a kind of a summary of Newtonian to uh, Lagrangian. That means Newton's laws of equations actually involve what is called the uh, position, velocities, etc. But Lagrangian mechanics uses more generalized coordinates and thereby generalizing the Newton's law into a much bigger perspective. So from New Isaac Newton, we went to Lagrangian and now this is the time we will look into this great Irish physicist, William Rowan Hamilton. So this is basically again a process of generalization which will make easier to work our other formulations. Now if I consider a small particle which is moving in one dimensional uh, potential, then what we see that the Hamiltonian, if we take the Hamiltonian of the system, it is given by this. And it is given by this. So uh, what is this uh, uh, speaking about? Let us explore into our next part. So you see this is basically a kind of a generalized momentum. This is basically the Hamiltonian, the total energy uh, of the classical particle. This is the kinetic energy. This is the potential energy. And the total energy is given by H equals to T plus V, which is the kinetic plus potential energy. Uh, if we take the general momentum of classical mechanics, that is mass times velocity, we can also write kinetic energy equals to half mv square, which would be as simple as writing equal to p square by 2m. So what I'm trying to make out of this, it is that, that we are relying on the same Newtonian mechanics, we are relying on the same kinetic and potential energy and adding up to 2, but in the Hamiltonian mechanics, we are considering the state of a particle which is described with its position and its momentum. We are also find that we use generalized coordinates as we did with Lagrangian, that it describes the momenta of a specific system. We also see that the reason why the kinetic energy is written in terms of momentum in Hamiltonian because momentum is much more fundamental quantity considering uh, Newton's velocity. These are basically the reasons that we generalize from Newtonian to Hamiltonian and now I, I would like to sum up uh, in a very clean manner you see that H represents the total energy which is T plus V it is a generalized momentum P square by 2m is the kinetic energy and this is the potential energy of the particular function so this uh, uh, part that is the T part is equal to P square by 2m which represents the kinetic energy and it depends on its momentum. Now if I take P squared by 2m, I get two parts. That is the kinetic energy, P squared by 2m, and Vx, that is the potential energy. What we find from here is that the P squared by 2m and kinetic energy and potential energy has been added together, yet the thing remains the same. We are relying on the invariance of Newtonian mechanics, but we have extended this further to what is called Hamiltonian mechanics. So here is something what we called uh, the extension of our understanding of Newtonian to Hamiltonian. Before that, we spoke about the Lagrangian. Now you see that uh, from here what we can say that Hamiltonian is a scalar function which means that it is independent obviously of the direction of motion. It can be used to derive the equations of motion, Hamiltonian in conserved in many physical systems and this is what we call is a kind of a table tabular structure where you can see the first feature is Hamiltonian is a scalar quantity which makes it easier for uh, making calculations, Lagrangian and Newtonian are vectors. Conservation in terms of system is much more in Hamiltonian and Lagrangian and Newtonian in certain cases we do not find the quantities as conserved and the uh, derivation of equations of motion are, motion are much more elegant I mean to say it is easier and in Lagrangian and Newtonian these things are com complex and it is difficult. So what we find from here is that we have moved from space and time and from the ancient ages and now we have extended Newtonian understanding into Hamiltonian understanding. Now what we understand from here is that 
these things actually measures kinetic energy, potential energy and other thing. But one thing is also important that is what does, I mean to say what does it actually, you know, measures the uh, uh, quantities. These are known as vector quantities. And how does the vector also have changed through our scientific evolution of understanding and thoughts coming up into the next part of our video. So here is something which is called classical physics, which is a total energy plus kinetic energy. In quantum physics also, we are getting uh, kinetic plus potential energy. But here you see this Hamiltonian is taken as something T plus V, which is also taken in quantum physics as a quantum operator. So here is the classical mechanics uh, Hamiltonian. This is the Hamiltonian operator. And you see it is more or less stands the same. So H is the operator in both the cases. This is kinetic energy. This is also kinetic energy this is potential and this is potential so it shows that how from Newtonian classical mechanics the same Hamiltonian has now been used as an operator and more or less again it is signifying something very deep that is again it is uniting kinetic and potential energy but here it is no more used as a function of position and momentum here it is used as an operator so what I was just telling a few minutes back is that from the classical mechanics now that we are moving into the other areas so we need to know that how vectors actually also changes so vectors are actually the i would say go to mathematical tools to describe quantities like displacement velocity and force they were invaluable in our understanding of motion and interactions now to tackle this is this is something which is called a plane vector in terms of euclidean geometry v equals to v1 v2 it's just adding the components now they were invaluable but they had limitations when it described when it came to describing certain phenomena now to tackle the changes posed by special theory of relativity the concept of four vectors were introduced so x y and z along with another dimension which is the time so four vectors extended the traditional three dimensional vectors by incorporating time as the fourth dimension and this is the mathematical representation and this is how we generalize the equation you see a0 e0 then a1 e1 and then we put it as a i e i so with four vectors space time events now could be represented as a single mathematical entity encompassing both spatial and temporal components we have already united space and time and this elegant formalism allowed physicists to analyze relativistic phenomena with newfound clarity so these are few examples that this is called a position four vector this is called a four gradient and this is called a four velocity all these have uh, got a change so the classical three-dimensional vector now is just extended into one which is called a four velocity and the question is that can this four velocity be used into Maxwell's equations which form the basic foundation of our understanding of electromagnetism let us look into the next part of our video so in the 19th century, James Clerk Maxwell's genius united electricity and magnetism, unveiling the fundamental laws governing the electromagnetic fields. This is the, his seminal work and his equations became the bedrock of classical electromagnetism. But this is something new which I wanted to tell you that the Cl James Clerk Maxwell's equation, the four equations which we see today are actually a set of 20 original equations. So when uh, Maxwell wrote, it was not four equations, but 20 equations what are those 20 equations a quick overview let us look into the next part of our video so I've just put up you see these are the three equations of magnetic force three equations of electric currents three equations of electromagnetic force these are the original equations so here it comes to nine then we move to three equations of elasticity electric resistance and total currents so here again nine plus six comes to nine plus yeah uh, nine plus to 18 and here uh, we get one equation of free electricity and one equation of continuity so originally it has been proposed as something which is called 20 equations and here you see these are finally these are the equations which we see now in the philosophical transactions of royal society this has been published and what I would like to show you that this is a research which I have uh, taken from Maxwell's original equations uh, by this uh, great person Frederick David Tum and I'm putting up this link of this research also also into the description box and you see this is the basic first page of the abstract 
uh, from Maxwell's original equation and this part underlined red actually shows that this equation at the end are only in fact eight equations and these are actually not 20 but this is actually reduced to eight who has done that Oliver Heaviside made a seminal contribution in terms of understanding uh, these equations so you see the electric flux the magnetic fields will not diverge the summary of electromagnetic equation and the magnetic field is a closed loop so it was actually 20 then it was reduced to 8 and then it was reduced to something which is called four equation and these are the equations which we generally see in terms of our uh, books in uh, science and when we study now, if we further go into this, we see that Oliver Heaviside, from where we move to James Clerk Maxwell, these are the equations, as you can see, these are looking quite familiar. Now, it was not long before physicists realized that the potential synergy between Maxwell's equations and special relativity, something extraordinary was going to unfold. Right on your screen, what you see is basically a generalization or a relativistic Maxwell's equation yes these are the relativistic Maxwell's equation and with special relativity Einstein provided the missing link to a harmonious world by incorporating time dilation length contraction electromagnetic phenomena now held true in all initial frames of reference these elegant equations as I have pointed out in arrow not only preserved Maxwell's equations original work but also adapted seamlessly to the new world which is the relativistic reality now I am not going to explain these equations because these equations will require ag again another video which if you want I can definitely put up please let me know in the comment box what I am trying to tell you is that these are Lorentz covariant forms of Maxwell's equations these equations are relativistic these equations follow some uh, the same uh, formulations and the obey the same laws which is mentioned by Einstein in his special theory of relativity question is that what do we mean when we say that the equation is relativi relativistic what actually makes the equation relativistic what are the features let us look into this part of our video what makes the equation relativistic now in simple plain language we say that an equation is relativistic that means it has the same meaning in all frames of reference so an equation being relativistic means that obviously it preserves its form and nothing changes when it is transferred to Lorentz transformation if I take this kind of an uh, coordinate x and t right and if you put the Maxwell's equation when we make a technically what we call a Lorentz boost and we take a Lorentz transformation and we go into this kind of a frame of reference where x changes to x prime and t changes to t prime we also see that these are the same what does that mean it means simply this Maxwell's equation preserve their form under Lorentz transformation now when you're doing this transformation the what we find the equations to be the same now the question is that why Maxwell's equation have this property why not other equations which were prior to uh, Maxwell's did not carry this property let us look into this part of our video now we need to understand one thing very clearly that Maxwell's equations form the basis of special theory of relativity if you look into the equations of Einstein if you look into the equations uh, when Einstein first uh, first wrote his theory of special relativity it was to make the uh, Maxwell's equation relativistic so the answer to this question what makes the equation relativistic we have already got that now what is the feature that we define Lorentz transformation as something which will preserve Maxwell's equation special relativity was built on the basis of Maxwell's equation and Maxwell's equation the basis of the seminal work of special relativity that means we know that it has to be relativistic but why not will Galilean relativity which was prior to Isaac Newton and what we find is that when we do look into this kind of an equations which are relative velocities either it is gets into minus or it gets into plus which shows that it should be greater than the speed of light and this is something which cannot be true according to the tenet of special relativity so these shows that Maxwell's equations are not invariant under Galilean transformation so this part of the video I believe till now this is quite clear that why Maxwell's equations are relativistic and why does it actually show that the other equation that is Galilean transformation was not relativistic because it violates the basic tenet of special relativity that means the equations are shows that something is moving greater than the speed of light and which is not which is not possible 
So the thing is that we now come to a bigger picture that an equation is said to be relativistic if it has the same form for all observers. So joining and it obviously preserves the same form uh, when we moves from one reference frame to another. So joining with starting with Michael Faraday, Coulomb and Ampere, we, uh, we generalize this to Maxwell's equation and finally it is further generalized into Einstein's relativistic equations which is Einstein's, uh, I would say, Einstein's uh, special theory of relativity showing Maxwell's equations to be relativistic. The question is that by this time when we are talking the quantum revolution has already started. So with Maxwell and Einstein we get Max Planck who has already founded something very important which is called a Planck's constant while doing his research on black body radiation. And the question here is that can we, uh, these Maxwell's relativistic equations can be made compatible, can we it made more generalized with something with quantum mechanics. Let us found into the next part of our video, we will be talking about Einstein and Dirac. Now, from uh, Einstein, uh, we, we find from here that special relativity now needs to be united with quantum mechanics into what is called QED or quantum electrodynamics. So, we already have special theory of relativity, we already have quantum mechanics which shows a promising future during that time and now can we add special relativity with quantum mechanics and form something which is called quantum electrodynamics, yes we can and this has already been done with full agreement between the rules of quantum mechanics and special relativity. So quantum mechanics actually describes all phenomena involving electrically charged particles which means that exchange of photons and it represents the quantum counterpart of classical electromagnetism as I told you that electromagnetism classically now has to be united with quantum mechanics and Feynman diagrams as, as usual plays a pivotal role in this. So in quantum uh, uh, electrodynamics, you see it is in full agreement with quantum mechanics. It was first formulated by Paul Dirac and it obviously talks about something which is called creation and annihilation operators. We will look into that and it has been thoroughly explained by the genius of Richard P. Feynman who explained what is called Feynman diagrams. Now these were actually united by uh, these contributors, Hugh and Wagner, Pascal Jordan, Heisenberg and Fermi. Now the question here is that uh, this is already done by giving a more robust mathematical structure. But marrying these two pillars of modern physics proves no easy feat. Quantum mechanics offered insights into particles discrete behaviors while special theory of relativity dictated that nothing could travel faster than the speed of light. Combining these frameworks seems like daunting task. Now, this is something which was done by Paul Adrian Morris Dirac and this is known as the Dirac equation. Now, what is that Dirac equation? We will just look into it very, uh, in a very uh, methodical and a very simple manner. So, you see that this is basically what we can understand till now. It is an equation with both the particles of quantum mechanics and theory of special relativity. So we already have relativistic Mac Maxwell's equation that means special relativity united with Maxwell. We already have quantum mechanics and with adding the relativistic special relativity Maxwell equation and quantum mechanics what we get is a Dirac equation. In this video I am not going to talk in details about Dirac equation. I am very quickly making a new video on Dirac equation which requires special attention and this is how the equation look like. Both of them are the same. The first one is a more extended version and the second one is a more compiled version. So let us look into what this equation actually tells in a very simple and easy manner. You see this alpha and beta, these are particle and anti-particle which was not actually in Dirac's mind but when we found, he found that there is something which is a particle and an opposite anti-particle. People did not believe what uh, Dirac propounded but later when the discovery of positron was done then people started to believe that yes what Dirac told was true. 
c squared would be the simple the speed of light and m is the mass of the particle this part is actually the spatial summation of three dimension in x y and z well p is basically the momentum operator and what we get from here is the first order derivative of the component and you can see it's something looks similar to schrodinger's equation but understand that schrodinger's equation were not relativistic and now with our dirac equation we can put the real relativistic equations along with special theory of relativity the question is that what actually the dirac equation tells we have understood the notations mathematics and overall idea what actually dirac equation tells coming up into the next part of our video so the dirac equation is basically a fundamental equation that behaves according to the special relativity and quantum mechanics so in technical word we can speak of fermions or matter or uh, particles which have got a spin half that and also behave like waves and it tells that their corresponding antimatter particles which are of electrons are called positrons so we can summarize that it des describes how electrons move at a higher speed how they behave it considers the wave like particles and the dirac equation actually was very important because it laid the groundwork of something which is called a quantum field theory which is a theoretical framework describing the behavior of fundamental particles and interaction the dirac equation in terms of modern physics is very important because it first mathematically reconciled quantum mechanics and special relativity leading to significant understanding in our uh, subatomic world so if i take this equation the question rises that why it is set to zero now why not so one or two so the answer is very simple we are actually looking for solutions to the equation where the wave function psi actually satisfy and also this zero actually means that we want to find the special solutions where the particles wave function satisfy the relativistic equations without adding external force now there are external forces which we can derive from this second order derivative which i'm not going to it so the setting the dirac equation zero means that we are studying the behavior of free particles in the relativistic quantum text text now till far we have now come to the uh, union and the generalization in terms of einstein to space time and to uh, uh, four vectors then quantum mechanics and so on but one thing still remains quite un unanswered that is what is the nature of space time and einstein's revolutionary idea in this regard was to envision space time as a dynamic fabric rippling and curving in response of mass and energy the motion of object was now intricately woven into something which is called a fabric to the cosmos uh, coming up into the next part of the video how this fabric of the cosmos behaves let us look into this so isaac newton's newton's laws of motions were uh, further generalized through einstein's field equations i've made many videos on that so i'm not just not uh, uh, talking about this part so you see the first law second law and the third law that is the laws of motion uh, uh, so uh, from uh, from einstein's field equation we can go to the first law second law and third law but here is something a very important catch from newton's laws of motion we cannot go to einstein's field equation that means it should be the other way round why because during that time these the concepts of space time tensors gravity curvature geodesics etc were not there so understand that from newton's laws of motion we cannot go to einstein's but from einstein's laws of motion or einstein's field equation we can come back to isaac newton so what do i mean by that so for example f equals to ma this forces or the equations of motion actually form the geodesics and the idea of gravity uh, turns into something which is called a curvature now let us look into it a little bit mathematically so this is basically the gravitational potential as per poisson's equation turns more generalized into the geodesic equation and newton's laws of motion taking into again the gravitational potential turns into something which is called the curvature of space time which has been written into einstein's field equation so this is what it is telling that motion is turning into geodesic and uh, gravity is turning into curvature so from curvature you can go back to geodesic uh, gravity and from geodesic we can go back to motion so the motion or the laws of motion how does it look like pictorially so if i take a ball and i start moving it in this particular path it shows that it has not changed that means it has moved into the straight path 
if I take a kind of a, a curvature which converges at a certain point and if I take a ball what will happen is that it will shrink in size and if I take a curvature which is diverted like this what will happen then the ball will increase in size so what we get from here is that these laws of motion which were predicted and written into Principia Mathematica Newton has been generalized as geodesics and this one shows the movement of geodesics so if I take a straight line and a path of a tram which moves around a curvature it generalizes the notion of a space-time and this curvature or the motion of the path is basically which is causing gravity what is the source of the gravity we know that this is the stress energy momentum tensor you can go to my other videos looking into it I have spoken enough about stress tensor and why do we need tensor and so what we can understand that this space-time which was uh, actually a geodesic uh, which was actually happening on Euclidean uh, space in Cartesian coordinates now follow a curvature and this curvature is actually what we call as the gravity so you see the, this Einstein's idea of entwining space-time into space-time and into a curvature where the motions of objects now are intricately woven lies into the fabric of cosmos so what we see from here that the law all the laws of motion if I take the first order as the second order derivative, everything these equations can now uh, be written into a flat space-time so Newtonian mechanics fairly operates well in the three-dimensional Euclidean space and the vectors can be represented using Cartesian coordinates. So you see the coordinates are quite straight. Now in order to measure the curvature that is from the flat surface, once we start moving into a curved surface, you see that these red lines are curving. So what does that mean that the uh, general Pythagorean rule actually doesn't quite take place over here? We cannot measure the distance between two points using the Euclidean or the Pythagoras' theorem. And that is why we need something which is called a tensor or a metric tensor which computes length between infinite simul distances on the manifold. So here comes the uh, components. This R actually is the Ricci curvature tensor which talks about how matter changes in the curve space. Again there is the R which is called a Ricci scalar which keeps the track how the size of a ball deviates from Euclidean space. Then we get something which is called a metric tensor which is the central idea of Einstein's field equation, the causal structure of space-time. And then we get a Riemann curvature which is hidden which again defines curvature on a Riemannian manifold and then we get something which is T which is called the stress energy momentum tensor which shows that the matter movement through space-time taking all this and summarizing into this equation we can simply say that the left hand side of the equation tells that tells that how matter measures the curvature of space-time that is the geometry and the right hand side shows that how matter co energy content moves around space-time that is the matter movement both of them are equated and as put up in this famous line that is space-time tells how matter how to move and matter tells space-time how to curve so we have found the enough amount of generalization starting from the uh, basic Newtonian aspects of space and time and then Maxwell's equation then relativistic Maxwell equations then Dirac's equation and then further into the fabric of space-time how Newton's laws of motions got generalized by Einstein and the uh, and the general theory of relativity actually changed the entire perspective of our understanding well there may be other we, uh, other ways there are other ways of generalization which i'm not uh taking in consideration to this part of our video because already the video is quite long and would like to conclude this video with this famous photograph so you see that here uh, this is an elephant and each person is trying to, to say their own perspective. Somebody says it is a fan, it is a spear, it is a snake, etc. So I would consider these each scientist like a blind man and we can only perceive a small part of the whole elephant which is the physics. We must acknowledge that our individual perspectives and research efforts are limited and no single scientist can grasp the entirety of the vast and complex field of physics. We must be willing to accept that our initial interpretations might be incomplete or even incorrect and we should be open to different perspectives and continuously re-evaluating our understanding allows for growth and progress in our pursuit of comprehending the vast and intricate field of physics. We should be humble and we should be collaborative and open-minded in our quest to unravel the mysteries of the universe.
I would like to thank you very much for watching this video and taking up your valuable time. If you have liked it, please do subscribe to my channel Physics for Students. Hit on the bell icon to get all the notification from Physics for Students. This is my email ID and this is my other channel which you can subscribe and you can follow me on my Facebook linkedin instagram and uh, twitter uh, accounts and you can also follow for certain important updates related to physics mathematics and cosmology into this fan page of stephen Hawking, which is there in facebook thank you very much for watching this video i would like to uh, you know thank all of you for supporting me throughout these years and physics for student will continue producing new and interesting videos but do let me know how do you like the video in the comment section and i will wait for the comments thank you very much and may the good Lord be with you.